welcome to Bergen and congratulations on winning the Holberg Prize. Thank you. I want to um, just read a part of the, the uh, Holberg Prize Committee's justification for giving you this award. Professor John Martinez Alia is a world leading scholar uh, of ecological economics, political ecology, and environmental justice. His transdisciplinary research integrates social and natural sciences, proposing a humanities driven form of economics. So the committee uh, gives you this award for influence in a broad number of uh, fields. And in particular, they emphasize this critical engagement with mainstream uh, economics. So first of all, um, thank you for taking the time to sit down and discuss your work and your ideas with me. Um, could you first talk a little bit about what is the significance of this, this award uh, for you and for your work? Yeah. Well, I don't think it's only for my work. I think it's for a new field or new fields yeah. of uh, studying and perhaps intervening also socially in fields like ecological economics and political ecology, mainly, and environmental justice. So I totally agree with, with this uh, definition of myself, academically speaking, that the Holberg Committee did contribution to ecological economics, political ecology, and environmental justice. And the difference in ecological economics with mainstream economics is that we focus, from my view, in two points. One is the metabolism of society. This is where the natural sciences came in, because metabolism is the study of energy and the study of materials, the, even the the chemicals that now are coming into the economy with the electrical transition. So energy and materials and how they change in the history of humankind. And this is the natural science part. And the other is about valuation, where we are critical as ecological economists of putting money values to everything as the mainstream economists like to do even on what they call externalities. So one point I always make that comes from Carl Wilhelm Kapp from a book from 1950 is that externalities are not so much market failures. It's not that the market does not reach enough to climate change or also biodiversity. We say that externalities are cost shifting successes. So the companies or the governments uh, succeed, uh, unfortunately, they succeed in transferring the social costs to other species or to future generations or to the poor people today. Yeah. So this is not something really very external, it's part of the economy. It, but it's funny that the economists call this externality. So what you want to do with your work is to make visible these so-called ex externalities, make visible how they shift these costs onto and, other actors and, and onto the, the planet. This is the political ecology part of it, yeah. bringing together ecological economics and political ecology, because ecology, uh, political ecology studies this kind of environmental conflicts. Yeah. So I like to think of, of ecological economics as, as, um, as, as a, an academic uh, discipline that tries to put the economy within its social and ecological context. Yes. Right? Could you, um, if you, if we go back a little bit uh, in time, and could you explain to us how you came into this line of work? What sort of drove you to, to explore these ideas and to develop them? Well, because there had been criticism of, of the economy from the 19th century already by people working in physics or chemistry or biology saying the economists are forgetting the study of the flows of energy. Frederick Soddy in Oxford, for instance, was a Nobel Prize. And he created in the 20s, he wrote several pamphlets criticizing the economists because precisely this. They said the economy is not circular, the economy is entropic. So there is the second law of thermodynamics that shows that if you're burning coal today, or oil or gas, tomorrow you cannot burn the same coal. In fact, you have produced carbon dioxide and then climate change. So this is an old criticism to which the economists did not pay much attention. Until that 71, there were several books written about this. 
So this is before my time. I was not into this yet. And Georgescu Regen wrote this book called The Entropy Law, Entropy Law and the Economic Process. And so this was an influence I had. But the other influence came more from ecological anthropology and from working on, on agricultural economics. So when I was 21, 22 years old, I had done economics in Barcelona. But then I went for one year to Stanford to do a master in, basically it was food economics. So we had, well, I learned about kilocalories in nutrition, protein, vitamins, and so on. So sometimes I say that the economies are a bit metaphysical because they talk about finances and so on, prices, quantities. But I knew about calories in food energy. And this made it easier for me to read the ecological anthropology that was being written in the late 60s and 70s. For instance, Roy Rapaport, who is a great anthropologist, and wrote this book about the Sembaga Maring in New Guinea. And on, well, showing, saying they have no markets or prices, but they have an economy. And the economy is how much food they are growing, how many calories they are producing, how they are feeding the pigs because they need the pigs for the protein. And all this is explained by the religion also, because they had a religion of how to use the land. This book influenced me very much. Yeah. And it was a book of ecological or energetic anthropology, we could say. So it comes from two sides, from criticism of economics, like Georgescu Regan mainly, and the other from reading anthropology because I was working on peasants on Peru at the time in the 60s. So I was reading a lot of anthropology. So precisely, I, I also understand that you, you, uh, your ideas were shaped by field work and by you know, yes. Peru and, and other places where you visited and, 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 and studied uh, farmers and peasants. Yes, um, yes because well, I was an economist and I became an agricultural economist mm. in the 60s and 70s and then I was in Oxford for many years, eight years, with, uh, as a student and then as a research fellow at St. Anthony's College, which I would like to thank now in retrospect, because it was a place for doing contemporary history. So I had many interesting young people, colleagues at the time. And I was doing agrarian studies, first in southern Spain, in Andalusia, then in Cuba, looking at the land reform, and then in Peru. And Peru influenced me very much because in the highlands of Peru, well, for the first time in my life, I saw this kind of peasantry who didn't want to be modernized in a yeah. way. They wanted to keep the land that had been stolen by the, by the conquerors, by the Spaniards, by the Europeans, and distribute it into haciendas. And there was this fight between communities and haciendas. Yeah, this yeah. I studied rather deeply because because of the land reform in Peru, a lot of archives of these papers available, correspondence of the owners with the administrators became available. Yeah. So one could look at it from the logic of the landowners and how they were confronted by these indigenous mm. peasants yeah. speaking Quechua, speaking their own language. Yeah. And I wrote a short book about this in Peru. So this was important also emotionally and and politically for me. And I became very much already a pro-peasant kind of, of, of uh, yeah. scholar. And this was when the Journal of Peasant Studies, because I was living in England often then, in Franco's time, I didn't want to go back to Spain, or couldn't really go back to Spain. And I, the Journal of Peasant Studies was founded in London in the early 70s which now has prospered quite a lot. It's a very well it's a very, yeah. journal in it's anthropology very and development studies. And it has become more narodnik, as I say, more pro-peasant than it was at the beginning. Mm. I myself, I am more pro-peasant yeah. than I was when I was 20 years old. <laughs> and this is from the experience you had of studying the peasants of ecology in... ecology yeah. and, um, yeah. and the, yeah, the knowledge mm. of realities. Right. But you also then feel work in India and other places, and it seems yeah. to be a theme 
in your work that you have uh, been interested in, in these uh, communities uh, or different social movements that are kind of resisting the negative effects of, of modernization and, see, and economic India development. It was a bit of a coincidence that happens in life, isn't it? Mm. But you have to, I think, in life you have to have like a general direction. Of course, you can become ill or you can die in an accident, but you have to have a kind of general direction. But of course, you have to do some matters, some, you cannot go, you don't know when you are young what you're going to do. But the general direction, I think you have to have, intellectually and politically also. And then I went to India because of this. I had published this book about the history of critiques against uh, mainstream economies. Somebody read this and they invited me to a meeting in Bangalore and it was very fortunate because it was a meeting of academics but also activists in southern India speaking English because that was the common language in different accents. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there was Ramachandra Guha in this meeting who is like 15 years younger than I am and also Matt Gaff, uh, Matt Huff Gadgil, who is a great ecologist. And I became friendly with them in that meeting, and I'm still very friendly with them right now. And, and Gua, Ramachandra Gua, was finishing his book on the Chipko movement in the Himalayas, his thesis. Not yet published, so I read the manuscript. And uh, it's a book, Peasants in the Himalaya, uh, complaining historically and in the 70s against uh, commercial or the British firm. The British colonists who wanted to uh, make forest state property. And later, private owners or private, well, land grabbers, because they were not, the land was not there, but they went there to cut the trees for commercial purposes mm. and have the people, the men and the women, uh, in a communal kind of, of land tenure, defending the trees. Yeah. And this is called the Chipko movement. And this is a very famous photo, I know, of, of women, women. Uh, circling a, and a, a tree. And a very but... famous book of mm. Ramgua, uh, which one of the first first books of environmental history anywhere in the world, published in 1989. Mm. And so we are still friends now. And this was a big influence because in India, of course, there is a lot of movement of what we call then already in 1990, we have several meetings with people in Mexico and in Peru and in, around the world. And Bina Agarbal was also there, Victor Toledo to set up, but we didn't get enough money to do it, but a kind of institute of study of this kind of, of ecological peasant movements. And we call the, this the environmentalism of the poor. Yeah, which is your book from 2002. And right? so, which yeah. now we would call environmentalism of the poor and the indigenous people. Yeah. yeah. Because there are many, well, yeah, many yeah. indigenous people who are the main protagonists of this. Right. Struggles like here, perhaps the Sami, or the Sami or the Inuits all around the Arctic, is the uh, pastoralists who are complaining against nickel mining, copper mining, mm -hmm. gas, oil, mm -hmm. or the extraction. Mm -hmm. okay? What is the main thesis of environmentalism of the poor? Would you explain that? Precisely, this is, is a kind of critique also of the idea that environmentalism was a kind of luxury of rich people. Mm -hmm which uh, they had everything already, two cars in the garage and a car or a boat, perhaps, or, and that they became interested in the whales and in the, you know, in the environment in an aesthetic sense, isn't it? Mm. And setting aside national parks yeah. and creating these boundaries well, around nature. has to yeah. take it seriously because, for instance, Arne Ness here, he developed this idea of deep ecology, which was very much a kind of mixture of sacredness perhaps, and also aesthetic appreciation. Well, Norway is a good place to, because <laughs> we have a beautiful landscapes and so on. But uh, apart from this, perhaps from the other side, one sees also that poor people around the world quite often, they also have feelings of sacredness, religious feelings about the environment, and they also have big material direct interest 
in the preservation of the environment because they depend very directly on the environment, isn't it? Mm. For food, for, for everything, for wood, yeah. and for, for even mm. for hunting, perhaps, mm. or fishing. So, but they know the environment and they respect the environment. And when there is a conflict about the extraction, it is the poor people, the indigenous people who are on the side of preservation. And the big companies like uh, Norx uh, Hydro or other companies around the world who would to make dams or mm. uh, to extract the copper. Or, uh, mm. Mm. One of the sessions here we are having this week is about uh, environmental conflicts around the Arctic, isn't it? Right, right, right. Which has become a huge issue yeah, lately. From our way around to, <laughs> to, to Russia, to Alaska, and mm. to Greenland, and to Iceland, mm. everywhere. You have, well, not in Iceland, but in the rest, you have this uh, conflict between pastoralists with the different indigenous names, isn't it? Yeah. And reindeers or calibus mm. and the uh, extractivist industry. So the Arctic has become like a commodity extraction frontier also. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Which has become very controversial around here. It is, yeah. yeah, yeah. But basically your argument there is that in, in this book um, is that there's a different type of environmentalism uh, other than sort of setting aside yeah. what, uh, <coughs> nature as wilderness well, uh, and to emphasize instead the environmentalism of the actors who use nature and who depend on it, but also have sacred values attached to it. Yeah, environmental is not a luxury mm. of the rich, so to speak, it's a necessity for, for everybody, the rich, but also the poor and the indigenous. And women are very often in the main protagonist of this. In also, sometimes it's not only in rural areas, it could be in cities or in industrial areas where people complain quite often because of health reasons, isn't it? Because of pollu pollution and so on. For instance, in India, one would have lots of complaints against coal power fire plants, mm. which are sometimes in the countryside near the mines of coal mines or sometimes in cities. And of course, all this is very bad for health. So you get the citizens' movements against coal-fired power plants in, in China also. Yeah. Same thing in, in my field of geography and urban geography. Uh, there's a lot of study showing how uh, waste disposal sites, for example, yeah. or, or, or um, industrial areas yeah. are very often placed near uh, to you know, uh, areas which have low socioeconomic standards, yeah. so to speak. So there's a sort of a, an injustice yeah. Uh, there, that, well, this is what in. we are trying to put in this address of environmental justice, isn't it? To collect. Well, this came from this book of 19, 2002, The Environmentals of the Poor. And then we, well, we, I, I thought with other people mm -hmm. that we should collect more of these conflicts. And we have done so. Right. So I want to introduce that a little bit to the viewers. So what you have done uh, is to create this online database of almost 4,000 um, environmental conflicts well, around, you say you around have the world. Done, yeah, well, I'm sorry. It's not in the singular, <laughs> no. it's in the plural, because you cannot, I cannot, nobody can not do, do it this. alone. No, no but it's a big team uh, of 100 people who have collaborated with this, yeah. and then perhaps eight people, 10 people who have been with this already for 10 years. Mm. Yeah. But it's a big effort, uh, and it's a very impressive um, set of materials, uh, and it covers environmental conflicts around the world, including in here, here in Norway. There are several conflicts that have been mapped onto this, this, this database. Well, I'm worried a little bit about the geographical coverage. What, what does this atlas show, do you think? What is the purpose of showing all these conflicts around the world? Well, I mean, the original conflict was two, two real objectives. Because we, we took the idea, actually, not from academics, but from activists. For instance, OCMAL in Latin America is called the Observatorio de Conflictos Mineros de America Latina. And it's in Chile, and there are four or five people that have been doing this also for a long time. And they are mapping environmental conflicts. This mapping also comes from the fact that there are now platforms that you can do this with in the web, isn't it? You couldn't do this before, as social historians in the archives, or anthropologists, isn't it? You could not, but now you can place them geographically very easily. 
And Okmal was one, uh, Fiocruz in Brazil. They also did a map of conflicts in Brazil. Then All Watch, which they have a lot of contact in Ecuador and in Nigeria, they said they were going to do this. They couldn't do it because it's too laborious. And if you are an activist, they have no time to 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 do these things. They they go from one fight to the next thing. And we had time as, as academics to do it. So that but the inspiration comes from activists. And the academic um, field, I think, is what we we call now comparative statistical political ecology, because we have so many thousands of cases now that one can do statistics also. So what does this show? What, what is the significance of this for, uh, well, for to academics? Advance, uh, to advance the science, of, the science of political ecology, not just to have political ecology based on one or two, what I respect this very much, deep cases, as my own little book on Peru, for instance, is not, not comparing 100 cases, it's just... So anthropologists usually do this and spend two or three years in one place and so on. So I have all respect for this. But what we do is to wider comparative thing. For instance, we can answer, I think, who are the protagonists, socially speaking, which social classes or groups are behind these protests. And of course, they are the local activists, peasants, uh, fisher folk, pastoralists, and so on. But also, we discover there are sometimes scientists, quite often, or religious groups. So in the elders of environmental justice, we have uh, geographically all these points with the conflicts. And, in, and some points represent conflicts in which religious groups have been active. And you, as you would expect, you have in Tibet, Buddhist people in Southeast Asia. In Philippines, you have uh, Christian groups. And in Latin America, you have liberation theology groups more involved. But uh, for instance, in Norway, I don't remember. Of course, you have uh, indigenous beliefs uh, in the, by the Sami people, isn't it? But I don't think you have uh, uh, really Protestant churches intervening in these conflicts. Perhaps I'm mistaken. No, I don't think that they're a big force. But I, I saw recently the, the Fusen case, which is a big uh, Sami uh, controversy going on at the moment, has, has recently been added. Uh, yeah. And the Alta case up in northern Norway. The Alta uh, case was, was a long time ago. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm. No, it's very interesting. And I also suspect that... Also the Lofoten case here, for instance. The Lofoten Islands, well I, know more, well, I know this second hand, but I mean, the Lofoten Islands, they are very rich as a fishery, isn't it? And very important in biodiversity. And I think that the decision now is to leave the oil and the gas in the sea, isn't it? Not to take it out. Yeah, we don't know if it's the final decision yet, but it's uh, at least uh, as well, a political it, issue, it, it's, it's, exceptional it's on ice. In the sense that it's exceptional in the world, yeah. because the Yasuni proposal in Ecuador, I was very much involved, failed, mm -hmm. because President Correa in my view boycotted it, but it was leaving oil in the soil in the Amazonia. And well, the Lofoten Islands is similar, but it's exceptional also because Norway is not stopping oil extraction <laughs> or gas extraction. Uh, but Islands. the Lofoten Island hit, this is a peculiar place, so it's a very interesting, it's a conflict, isn't it? It is the a conflict, conflict, but I do think that it's a, a, a conflict where we see that activism has played a big role in, in what, yeah. the, what the decision turns out to be. Yeah. So, so but it sense. has no religious overtones, for instance. Oh, that's true. So you could do this kind of comparative studies on who are the protagonists, and you can also see who, which cases are successful, at least provisionally, as you say. Mm -hmm. You can also see the violence, how many people are getting killed. Also, there is a geography of this. Yeah. And today or tomorrow, there is a new article being published with cases in the others. And one cause is Senia Hanasik, who is here for, the, for this Holberg week. It's published in Nature Sustainability, which is a good journal, and it's about some 120 women activists killed around the world. 
with the names and the circumstances and some statistics and so on. I want to talk about um, ecological economics uh, and especially the, the relationship between ecological economics as a field and as a mainstream uh, economics. Uh, there's been some debate here in Norway around uh, what is the position of ecological economics versus uh, mainstream economics. Uh, and I know that you've been critical at times of, of the role of mainstream economics and, and sort of its, its power um, as an ec uh, academic uh, discipline. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? What do you think the relationship between ecological economics is uh, well, and, and mainstream economics? One is that ecological economics is more a field of studies, not just mm -hmm. a discipline. And in fact, among the early ecological economists, there were people like Carl Folke in Sweden or Anne-Marie Janssen before him, who died, and other people in Sweden. And also, for instance, now, people like Ariel Vatten in the Norwegian people who are concerned about the social metabolism, isn't it? So the economists, sometimes every 20 years, they realize that there is an energy crisis, and then they become interested in energy. Ecological economists are always interested in it. They think, we think, that to describe the economy, you can not only use the GDP, the economic measurements, you should use also the physical kind of assessments in terms of biodiversity and in terms of metabolism, energy, materials that we're using. So this is one difference. Ecological economics is wider than mainstream economics yeah. or even Marxist economics who did not go enough, at least into the physical aspects, isn't it? And the other aspect is about valuation, as I said before. The, the mainstream economists tend to give importance to topics depending on the price they can get, isn't it? To biodiversity, for instance, and so on. Or to put the externalities, as they call it, into the price system, putting money values to them. And we believe rather in plural, value, plural values or even in incommensurability, meaning that you cannot uh, measure everything in the same units. You cannot measure sacredness in terms of money, isn't it? Or even human life, depending on the situation. Human life, if, if for instance, somebody has a car accident and dies and is insured, the insurance company will pay something. But is this uh, the value of human life? Well, it depends on what you mean by value, but if value means importance, this person killed for the family, has a different kind of, or for the community, has a different kind of value, isn't it? Sure. So it's not true that, and, and for decision making, I think it's wrong. Well, ecological economists believe is of, of wrong. Yeah, it's wrong, I think. But it's also is a lack of imagination to think that everything has to be reduced to a cost-benefit analysis in, in economic terms. And going back to Norwegian conflicts, in this wind energy conflict, was Rosen? Uh, yeah. Fosen. Uh, Fosen. Fosen. Right. I think that the Supreme Court, in fact, had a decision in which didn't say whether this was too expensive or cheap or anything like this. They said, apart from the economic cost or the economic benefit, there are the indigenous rights, isn't it? Who have not been respected. Yeah. But and, and with the Alta River uh, conflict, in which the dam was built, there was also a discussion about which values were more relevant for this dispute. So there are conflicts of uh, values, isn't it? Uh, precisely. But not whether the value is going to be a lot of money or little money, about which kind of value of the many values, which ones should be more relevant in this kind of decisions. What about cases where, um, say, you want to build? They want to build a, a big road through a, 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 um, a, a natural area. Right, and um, since we don't have a sort of a price on, on on nature, then that is not taken into account into the whole calculation 
So in a sense, nature loses. Um, is that a case where it would be possible to be pragmatic and say, okay, well, we do need to place some sort of value on nature in order to to make sure it's part yeah, well, of, of the institutional uh, decision-making process? That is better to, that if you have to have a decision, hmm. this what cost-benefit analysis was invented already in the, in the 40s, actually, 1940s, in this kind of, in fact, was applied to this kind of issues like building dams on the Colorado River and other rivers, and they, and they said, well, landscape has been destroyed, the fishing of salmon has been destroyed in the northwest of the U.S., and, and there is also uh, ecological values and aesthetic values, and this is not counted by the firms doing this. So we're going to give fictitious prices to these uh, damages. And many people thought this is better than nothing. Well, and we are not so sure it's better than nothing because first depends on whether the price is going to be, of the damage is going to be very high or very little. Then there are technical questions of how you can elicit, no? find a cost in money terms for something which is not in the market. So you ask people how much would you pay for this to be preserved and so on. This is like complicating life in order to impose the language of economics when life is, is complicated but it's even, it's even more complex, meaning that, that the, there is no reason why the economic language should be more powerful than the other valuation languages. Isn't it? So that's why we call this political ecology. It's a political decision to use money prices, even fictitious prices or costs. And it's also a political decision to decide, hopefully rationally, and after deliberations, but using different values, plural values, which are not commensurable, they are not reducible to only one unit. And this, for instance, in practical terms, the IPBS, which is la, like the IPCC for climate change, as the International Panel of Scientists to discuss about climate change. Now there is a similar body for biodiversity. And if you read the report they are doing, they are using this expression, plural values. There are plural values and we have to decide you, I mean you, I don't know who decides. The, everybody should decide a little bit. Politicians and, and movements and so on. Who decides is a different question, but the decision should be taken, uh, taking into account the plurality of values. So you have, you have worked on these ideas, but you've also been, uh, been uh, focused on say, building the journal of ecological economics uh, yes. and, and the society and it seems like you've also emphasized sort of institution building and, and building a journal for this yes. this field of research. Um, why, is, why is that important? Why has that no, been so important to you? I also founded a journal in Spanish called Ecología Política in 19, 1990, which still goes on every six months. Yeah. Well, I believe, well, oh, this is usually uh, academic life like this, and you, you write well, you write uh, academic articles, and then you write textbooks, and then journals are founded around disciplines or fields of study. And ecologically, I was one of the founders, but I was not the main founder. Herman Daly was the Bob Costanza, and Marie Johnson, who died, unfortunately, some years ago. These were the main people around the journal, Ecological Economics. No. The part of political ecology, I think, is still uh, less stabilized. Well, political ecology comes from geography and from anthropology, as you know. But in this, this new book, I think, I hope, is going to have an influence. And links with economics because, um, since we are here in Norway, Norway is one of the places where the idea of sustainable development was born, isn't it? And people would refer to sustainable development as the Brundtland Report yeah. of 87. 
and Brunner was at the time the Prime Minister. We are very proud of this, the, the Brutron Commission and, and this idea of sustainable development yeah. that we really attribute to her. But I know that you're quite, quite no, critical of sustainable more, development. More or less at the same time, uh, for people come from the idea of development, which, which come from the 40s, isn't it? Some people were criticizing it from two sides. One people like Arturo Escobar, Gustavo Esteban, were saying, it seems that we want the North, the rich people, to develop the underdeveloped countries all in the same way towards modernity, and they discuss this. So there is a discussion about the idea of development. And then, of course, sustainable development is criticized by ecological economics. But then there is like a third approach to this from Amartya Sen and Marta Nussbaum, who got a Holbert Prize a few years ago. And what they say is that development should mean not just increase in GDP, in the in the gross national product, not economic growth, as it's usually measured. They say this, being well, Amartya Sen is a very famous economist, and he has this book called Development as Freedom. And he says development does not mean increased GDP. Development means increasing the capabilities of the people to fill their own fulfilling their own lives at the extreme that they are able to do, not curtailing people uh, by depriving them of, of, of work or subsistence and so on. And this links very much with what my slogan of land, water and freedom, because I think that uh, many of these environmental conflicts about which Amartya Sen has never discussed, actually, in explicitly, but in fact what they do is they cartel, they, they stop people from living good lives. Because if you are a community anywhere in the world and North Hydro comes or in, or in Pregil or Saline from Italy and builds a dam, or the government itself, like in China, the, the state government builds a big dam, many people are going to be displaced, isn't it? So this is not good for a fulfilling your own capabilities in life. And the same thing one could talk about oil extraction in the Amazon, or nickel mining in Nouvelle Caledonie, or copper mining in Bougainville Island, or in the highlands of Peru, in Las Bambas, in Apurimac right now, in which people complain because they are deprived of water, air, clean air, and land for their own needs, isn't it? Yeah. So I think if development has to be freedom, development should be very different from economic growth, which is based in increasing energy and materials, and therefore in going to the commodity extraction frontiers to extract this. So all this fits together. Yeah. The critique of economics or mainstream economics with the political ecology so, of so, environmental uh, movements. So ecological economics, the main critique against sustainable development is that it's, it's based on continued economic growth. Is that correct? Well, this and also the valuation, which I think is they are too narrow in the valuation of mainstream economics. Yeah. So what is the alternative path? I know you've been writing about degrowth um, yeah. a, a lot lately, which has become, I would say, a, a, a movement in itself within academia, but also outside of academia. Yeah, well, see, well, this is a bit surprising to me that degrowth is, has such a success among young people or some young people in Europe. It's only in Europe, I think, perhaps in Australia, the US also. And, well, I think that for me, the growth comes from ecological macroeconomics. So the part of ecological economics dealing with the macroeconomy. And this comes from Georges Reagan, who in France, he probably, or somebody translated some of his articles, uh, Jack Greenewald, in 1979 and published a short book of essays by Georges Corrine called Demain la décroissance, Tomorrow the Growth. 
And he, uh, Georgescu had studied his statistics in France in, when he was 20 something. And he did a doctoral thesis in France, so he knew French well. He was from Romania. And so he agreed to the title. Oh, he didn't use the growth, he didn't use the word degrowth in English ever. But he agreed with this title for this book in French, La Décroissance, which means the growth. So this is one of the origins. Herman Daly follows suit with the steady state economy. Tim Jackson with prosperity without growth. Peter Victor with a book which is called Managing Without Growth already 20 years ago. And then this has been followed by the the younger people now preaching degrowth. And they come partly from France, but also from other places, like Giorgio Scalis in, in, now and, in Barcelona. Yeah, and your institute, right? Yeah, that and, seems uh, to be like a hotspot for thinking yeah, around yeah, degrowth. Is, yeah, in a way, uh, I am the founder, mm. uh, but they don't come because of me. They come because they found the place. Yeah. And now they are better known than I am <laughs> in the growth, like yeah. George Scalis and Jason Hickel, Julia Sternberger in Lausanne. They got a big grant now yeah. from the European Research Center, the, the ERC, a synergy grant for 10 million. So if you want to measure things in terms of money, the growth has become very important. <laughs> <laughs> and because it's a big grant for the research, isn't it? Exactly. So I, I am part of them, but I am not. I am a bit like the grandfather by now. They don't follow me very closely. Mm. They have their own. And, and I think they are very focused now. Well, on some experiments, like uh, yeah, little social experiments, but also in public policies. So they had in Brussels just a month ago this meeting in the European Parliament with the Greens in the Parliament, but also Ursula von der Leyen went to the inauguration to discuss what they call it post-growth, because the growth is still too strong politically. But they know, everybody knows what they mean. They mean degrowth disguised as post-growth. And the whole Parliament was debating this. And I think, in fact, I mean, Germany is not growing the economy and Japan is not growing the economy, Britain for other reasons. So we are moving into a post-growth economy because if we have to, to decrease carbon dioxide emissions, economic growth has to stop, to put it simply. Technologies have to stop, population growth has to stop, which is doing. Population growth is stopping by itself in a way. And, and, but also we cannot burn coal, oil and gas as we know. How burning less fossil fuels is compatible with economic growth, yes, I think it's pure imagination, it's not possible. But we're still quite far from stopping economic growth at, at a global level, right? I mean, uh, yeah, you can yeah. say that some countries are, are, are in a, a recession in a sense, but it's still, yeah. we're still growing and using more and more resources. And therefore, we are far still, not very far, but, but not yet, at stopping the growth in emissions, not just decreasing emissions by half as we, of carbon dioxide, as the Paris, Paris Agreement and so on. Uh, we are talking, but we are doing nothing as, a, as, as, as the human race or the rich people, because if everybody had the per capita emissions of India, well, there are many rich people, but the average would be the carbon dioxide would be absorbed by the oceans and the new vegetation. There would be not increase greenhouse effect, isn't it? So it's the rich people in history and today that we are responsible, I think, for this. But we have not reached peak emissions and we have not reached peak economic growth, it's true. But how do we turn this around? I mean, what does degrowth look like as a sort of a policy proposal or as a, as a, um, yeah. as, as a political claim? Well, it means in the rich countries to decrease the use of energy and materials and to change the composition, of course. 
but not object, not be so optimistic. I think that you have, can have an electrical transition and this will come with economic growth. It's mm -hmm. too many, too much, too difficult. It's much easier to have some economic growth, perhaps preserving welfare by, by well, it's not, we're, we're consuming so much. For instance, everybody, the few days I'm here, when people say the landscape in Norway is over the fjords and so on, but suddenly comes a cruise with, uh, <laughs> I don't know how much, 80 meters high. And so this is a bit excessive, isn't it, perhaps? So we could we decrease in the rich countries, but then in the poor countries in the world, including perhaps regions of China, certainly India, most of Africa and so on, you cannot go to any African country preaching the growth. It's like a bad joke. It's, a, it's really would be in a very bad taste. It would be like insulting, isn't it? But what it, in my view, many of these movements around the world, for local reasons, they stop coal mines, they stop coal fire power plants, they stop even nickel mines or copper mines sometimes, uh, and they stop even windmills sometimes, isn't it? For local reasons, many of these groups at the same time are saying, please, a little bit of degrowth because we are very badly paid, we are deprived of what we need for a living, and all this doesn't make any sense. I think this is a very much Latin American view also against extractivism, isn't it? Selling raw materials at a very low price, as has happened in the last 200 years, but more and more materials, and the price does not go up, goes down rather. So the terms of trade are very bad, and so there is a reaction, at least intellectually and politically, right now in Colombia, for instance. The president of Colombia, if he were here, he would agree with everything I am saying. He would say it's too difficult politically. Yeah, I agree. Well, um, he would agree. Uh, so uh, I was writing in the newspaper a little bit about your, 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 your work uh, since you got the prize and about degrowth. Uh, and one journalist asked all the political parties in the Norwegian parliament what they thought about the idea of, of degrowth. And only the Green Party was a little bit positive, but for the rest, they're saying, no, we need more growth to deliver more services to our citizens. So it seems to me that it's, it, it's um, uh, that many will, will agree on principle or from a rationality standpoint, but as a political proposal, it's difficult for the politicians to say, you know, two people, well, we want to give less. Even, they would even agree that the uh, Lofoten Islands decision is uh, like an example of degrowth, isn't it? But in general, they would not agree, yeah, that's true, because they are all fashion, I think. They, <laughs> they haven't thought enough about it. Or I think at the political level, in even at the UN level, things are being solved by words. Well, sustainable, de sustainable development, in the view of ecological economics, which was founded more or less also in 87, 88, as a group of people, we always criticize sustainable development saying this is a contradiction, or as they said, an oxymoron, mm -hmm. because you cannot have economic growth. If development means economic growth, this cannot be sustainable with today's technologies, which are very much the same as the technologies of 40 years ago, fossil fuels, basically. Therefore, and now in the sustainable development goals, which are very good, very plausible, very good uh, agenda for the few decades ahead, but number eight says decent work for everybody. Okay, decent work, this, they mean decent, uh, wage work, okay, for everybody, and they also say economic growth. Yeah. Growth, not even development, not even uh, euphemism. Econo so we have written, Jason Kicker, myself and other people, we have said we are in favor of sustainable development goals, except number eight. You are making a mistake, but we know for what you, what you, the international community, as they call it, or United Nations say this because you don't know 
how to manage without growth, even the rich countries. Why not without, because of the public debt? If you go to Italy and say, the growth, say, who's going to pay the debt? And because of employment also, without growth, there is going to be less wage employment, this is true. So we have to arrange a different way of giving money to people, as we did in the pandemics. Money was dished out to people, even if they didn't have work, isn't it? So, so where do we start? Where do we move? How do we move beyond growth? Um, you just referred to the basic universal income. Um, yes. Is that a good, is that where we need to start? Well, do you think? I would be in favor of this, yes, because it would diminish this anguish that if you are 18 years old or 25 or 50 and you don't have a wage job, you are useless and you don't get any money, or you get money as a charity, isn't it? So work does not mean only wage work. For instance, domestic work, as the feminist movement has explained so many times, is very useful work and usually is not paid for. If we would, our brain is more or less in good order, we can still do things, isn't it? And this is, well, we have pensions, so pension is like a kind of of universal income for all people. We are all in favor of this. But of course, the, the normal economy would say, well, yeah, but who is going to pay the pensions? So we need economic growth to pay the pensions. Yeah, these things are very good objections. But the other, the theory that we need growth, you have to reply, what is the metabolism of this growth? How are you going to have growth without oil, gas, and coal? Yeah. Which, and then they can dream and about fusion energy. Well, the dream is not dreaming, but it's just a kind of technological optimism, which is not very rational. Because, for instance, nuclear energy was supposed to be a panacea and has proved to be dangerous, and we don't know what to do with the residues. The Green Minister in Germany, who recently said, we're stopping nuclear energy in Germany. We have enjoyed it for 30 years, and now I don't, we, I don't know who's going to take care of it for 30,000 years yeah. for the, of the plutonium. But it seems to me that now, compared to before, we are quite, we're living in a time of, of, of a significant technological optimism. There's a, many who are, be, be. who are, you know, quite optimistic, I think the younger generations have seen lots of technological change in their time. And there's this belief that yeah. we can solve these problems through through technology. And we see this in some, some surveys with, with young people that many of them are quite optimistic that, you know, we'll invent something that will change, that will solve the energy yeah. crisis or... Well, they would tell them, yeah, well, it's so much better, but we're going to invent what? Please mm -hmm. give the details, isn't it? Because in the 19th, well, there are all these things, if you're explaining history, it's not very relevant for the future. But there are, when science advances, some technologies come into being, like the steam engine, for instance, which first was a practical thing, and then they did the science of it. And they proved that you cannot have a perpetuum mobile, that you have to put energy in order to get energy, and you put more than you get. So there are things like this, especially nuclear energy, I think, prove not such a benefit for humankind, although, of course, it's used in medicine and so on. Mm -hmm. But I think that science, of course, will advance. No, I cannot predict the next hundred years, and informatics clearly is changing communications and so on. But whether this will diminish the greenhouse effect, will stop biodiversity loss, uh, how? With genetics, resurrecting the lost species, perhaps. But will be very different, isn't it? Mm. So for young people going into research? I think one, one force which should be used is the force of the inequality. Inequality, of course, uh, is the, the powerful and the rich against the poor. And this is increasing in the world, isn't it? And there is resentments, not in history, or there is complaints. 
the French Revolution, they start, they wrote Le Cahier de Doléances, no? lots of documents complaining to the king, a little bit like the map of environmental injustices. It's a collection of Cahier de Doléances. So this is also a force in history. And this perhaps could be yours, this environmental movement saying we cannot go on like this, we have to change, we cannot change the environment to the against poor people, future generations. So we have these movements of young people also, which make one feel optimistic. Yeah. <clears throat> what about young researchers today, people going into research? What do you think are the most um, powerful ideas and the powerful fields uh, to study if you want to? To change the world in a positive the ones direction. I feel should be the most important would be, in a way, because now with the Holbert Prize, mm -hmm. we are sort of commemorating somebody who, who cultivated the humanities and mm -hmm. even satirical theater, which I think is a very good thing to do, to do satirical theater. But also uh, the language and theology and law and so on. But I think that even Environmental humanities is a good field, which is growing, but should not be separated from the natural sciences, from the history of science. So this kind of mixture of natural science and social sciences is something that we should do much more. Yeah. And also I think that they feel a little bit of optimistic, optimistic about this, that what we are discussing here is relevant also for business economics. And I don't know the percentage, but perhaps 10% of the people going to university or more than 5%, they don't do economics, they do business economics or business administration, isn't it? Well, hoping to do something practical and to make some money, I suppose. And in, in business economics, this should be a big part of it should be about the environment because they cannot claim that the environment is not relevant, both as a source of inputs and also as a place to dump the waste, isn't it? And therefore, all this question of the externalities and so on should be very much part of the curriculum. And the environmental liabilities, which they don't count, the environmental liabilities, and also the, well, how accounting should be modified by all this way of looking at things. So in fact, we are publishing some articles based on the others, on the Vale Company in Brazil, in Prigilo, also Enel in Italy. So we are producing now some with other people around the world. It's not only which are linked to the environmental justice others, business, ecological economics. And I think more people could go into this discipline. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, congratulations again, and thank you for taking the time. Thank you to you. Thank you.